I'm Hank Iris from Iris Motorsport here in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're on campus at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. What started off as about a 2,800 square foot facility, just doing fab work, has ballooned into a little over 20,000 feet, four facilities, an engine building program, a dyno facility, manufacturing service, transmission programs. It's kind of turned into the, the ability to control our own destiny by doing all of it ourselves. Mid 90s. If you wanted to go chase powder and chase good skiing, you either drove a Subaru, an Audi, or a big truck. So Audi was kind of what we gravitated towards. I grew up in like that era of EFI, like EFI was just starting to get going. And so you know, I just started playing around with that. Uh, my dad had this old TIG welder that he got in trade, and so I started making exhaust manifolds for my my five cylinders, a little old 10 valve stuff. And um, I worked at a couple of CNC machine shops and I worked at a, a welding shop where I learned how to weld a little bit better and um, got into an engineering program up in Utah. I worked at the steakhouse as a server <laughs> to get through school. I was just terrible at it. Hey, where's my steak? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but I had a little 800 square foot unit just to work on my own cars and play with my own stuff. And I was welding up in this barn um, making manifolds, and that's how I got myself through college. So by the time I graduated college with an engineering degree, I was pretty, I'd made quite a few manifolds. People were starting to want some of my, my welding goods, so instead of going and working for the man, I opened up Iris Motors for it. First piece of equipment I bought and the first uh, welding table I had, welded by myself for about a year and a half, and then hired my first employee. And if you don't prove the parts, then it's harder to sell them. So then you start figuring out you need to do the tuning as well. And then you do the tuning and realize you really need to build engines. You deal with other people building your engines and it's a giant cluster. And so you're back to you know, just trying to figure out how to do that yourself and learn. And, and then pretty soon you need a dyno to be able to do it, to be able to test the power instead of using somebody else's dyno on their terms. And so you need a dyno. And then it's, way well, we're blowing up transmissions. Like, we better figure out a transmission program. So it just kind of ballooned into what it is today. Uh, we employ 16 people now ship parts all over the world and kind of niched into this five-cylinder world. Audi acquired Lamborghini in the early 2000s and they developed that V10, which is basically just two five-cylinders me melded together and they put the half of it into the TTRS and the RS3 and into a Jetta here stateside. So, you know, it's red car behind me. That was that uh, when we were super slow and had nothing better to do. We'd swapped one of those motors from a transverse application to a longitudinal and then when they finally decided to bring the RS3 into America in, in 2017, it was just a little bit of dumb luck because we were already building those engines for longitudinal swaps. So, you know, it was, it was easy for people to translate and to trust us with building engines and making power in the native spot versus just the longitudinal. You know, Europe always got the DSG, got the dual clutch. And, you know, finally when the, the RS3, the 8V platform came to the States with the DSG, it was on because we just knew that we'd always kind of speculated that if we had that dual clutch we'd be pretty fast and that's exactly what happened and um, you know we just we, we really grabbed that market and, and dominated that market I think the the platform's been out for 60 months now of the 60 months I think we've held the world record for it for 55 of those 60 so <laughs> You know, that V10 is, is, Audi's super lazy. So like, they, they like to parts build, you know, they like to use, cross use parts. So for example, the controller that's in the V10 dual clutch in the DL800, if you open up that transmission and look at the controller, it says DQ500 right on it. That's the code for the RS3 and TTRS. The people specialize in V10s, they had to learn that stuff on the V10. We had already had a pretty good grasp on that just because the five cylinder stuff was very similar. You know, valve train's identical, cams are pretty darn close to being the same outside of firing order. You know, we're already spending these five cylinders to 92, 9500. What's the difference if there's just two banks? Um, so yeah, the, the V10 just kind of kind of jumped in there. And there's some good, other things, there's really good competition in the V10 world. You know, Underground's done a fantastic job throughout the years. T1 is in it, thick of it now. AMS has done a really good job. So, you know, it's kind of, the RS3 world's, it's really hard chasing ghosts. It's really hard just chasing your own records. It's really a lot of fun to chase other people and to have that competitive fire. And like this whole industry is just a male ego trip, right? <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, I think that's a big part of, of you know our success is it's engineering based. It's not always the easiest or whatever, but you know we do really good engineering data. So our whole realm is trying to figure out how to make cars faster by just looking at the physics problem and um, thinking outside the box. So the V10 world, the problem that everybody's having at this point is just the the physics of the car, where you have this big V10 and transmission behind, well, sitting on the almost the rear axle. The knee-jerk solution for mounting turbos is just to make little up pipes and mount turbos um, on the rear bumper, but if you're having a hard time keeping the front end down, putting 45-pound turbos and wastegates behind the rear axle is about the worst idea possible. We really saw early on with you know this blue car behind me that it's, it's really hard to keep the nose down. We were the first ones to go seven stock engine with the R8s. I think we did that in under a year of jumping into that platform. So we were able to do in a year what people hadn't done in 10 years. So it kind of put us in that arena where people understood that if we really wanted to, we could. I like flew in to meet the car to track up in California and did the first few hits. And we were close, it was like 802, 801, but the 60 foot was just terrible. Like we couldn't get the front end to stay down. So I like took my carry-on bag and we put it in the front and did a did a pass and yeah the 60 foot improved and like the front end stayed down so you know we added more juice in it and pretty soon it's starting to lift and so i you know threw some water jugs in my carry-on suitcase and put it in the front and shoot by the we just kept doing that and the 60 foot kept dropping we kept adding weight to it so by the end we were i think my carry-on was like 130 pounds you know in the little suitcase we were shoving tools and ratchets and so, so the weight in the front is pretty pretty extreme but it's still a, a mass problem you're trying to figure out how to to keep the front end of the car down with a lot of weight in the back so the gt4 made a lot of sense just because being a road race car it has a huge front radiator and they don't use the, the side seals for cooling engine water. It's for the engine air to oil for the transmission. So we felt like we could mount turbos there and a straight line application that's, we don't really need those coolers probably as much as, as you need it on a road car. So this made more sense. And then just the safety aspect of it. I think people are nuts for going out to these half mile events with or an hour away from a hospital and going 230, 240, 250 miles an hour. It's just and I'm kind of fond of breathing, so. Yeah, yeah, so it comes with a full FIA certified cage. Uh, it's not something that was just built in a fab shop using get best guesses. It's, um, you know, it comes with the documentation. The actual carbon tub of it is significantly thicker than the road car as well. So they, they, they strengthen it quite a bit. But yeah, and then it just has good aero. I mean, it has a, a big front blitter and big dive planes that we're hoping that can help keep the front end down at speed. and. I mean, these things are getting to where we're trapping 155, 160 in the eighth. So you, know, you always say like, oh, well, aero doesn't work if you're not moving. Well, if they're moving. <laughs> we can get downforce to, to make it to where we don't really have to use just raw weight to fake the force equals mass times acceleration. So that's kind of what the aspect we're looking at is can we, can we move as much weight forward? Can we, can we bias more of the weight towards the front? And can we use just aerodynamics to keep the front ends down and, and power that way. So the GT4 is a two-wheel drive car. We've converted it to four-wheel drive. It just will be a MoTeC car on with Datsun's latest parts for transmission. And we're, we're on 79 millimeter turbos now. So we're hoping this year that we'll get some runs in at 26, 2700 wheel horsepower. But we feel like that much with the weight of the car, we probably can go pretty deep into the sevens. Maybe touch on the sixes this year. We'll see. I mean, I'm sure we'll get grief for it being a race car start off, but it's, they're two-door cars. It's not like pulling interior out really saves a bunch of weight. It's, it's just a safe version of the road car. Yeah, yeah, so the, the red car is just the, I, I bought that car um, bef right before college. It's a parts car, actually. <laughs> that, that car is of significance just because it's uh, the first car that got an 07K coded engine. You know, 07K in the Audi world is the, the engine code, much like 4G63 is in the Evo world. So, you know, we, we swapped that engine longitudinally and I think the car makes almost a thousand horsepower at this point. But that really was a nice springboard for us into the RS3s and the, just because it showed people that we could build those engines and keep them together. So it didn't matter which way the engine was facing, it, we, we could get her done. And so that's been a pretty iconic car throughout my business of just people know that car pretty well. You know, we try to do two builds a week. And so it's a lot of builds a year. And we do them in, you know, we, we shoot for 12 to 14 week schedules where, you know, they come in, they get the motors torn out of them, we start building them. And it's just a rotation of assembly work. You know, we 
print 1,000 horsepower TTRSs and RS3s every week. So the new RS3 is a monster. I've done some stuff that I never thought Audi would do. Drift mode. The engine's almost an identical carryover. There's virtually no difference in the engine. Um, the wiring's a little bit different and it utilizes uh, an MG1 ECU instead of the old MED Bosch ECU. But the real, the real gem of the car is instead of having an open rear differential with a clutch pack for the center differential, what they call Haldex, is they've departed from that and there's no differential in the drive shaft or in the transfer case. There's only two clutches in the rear end and so it's the rear end is acting as a center differential and as a rear differential. It's looking at your pitch angle and where you're at in the turn and you know the dynamic of the car and it's deciding how much it wants to open and close each clutch pack. So it does some really interesting things like when you're coming into initiating a turn it it will grab a brake on the inside tire to get the car to start to slide with an open differential because you you, know, you and I have both welded a differential with a <laughs> with a MIG welder and it's awesome once you're into the slide, but it has no turn in. They don't want to turn in. They're just, they're fighting an axle that's chirping along. So, you know, that's basically what it's doing is it's using the brake to start the, the slide, and then it's gradually turning it into a locked LSD as it's in the turn. And then when it senses steering wheel angle that you're coming out of the turn, it starts to release that to give it a clean exit. It's ingenious. I don't know why more people haven't done that, but it, it um, and it simplifies things. You don't have a center differential anymore. They, they realize that differential is special, and so they've made the front end of that car an inch wider to where bigger fenders, we can fit pretty much a half inch wider wheel and tire on the car versus the old car. It's the same engine, and same exact transmission, so everything we've done with these cars is, this is a way better straight line car, is what, the way that I see the, the cookie crumbling is that You'll still use this if you want to go straight in line, but for turns, the new car is just, it's immensely better. Spring Mountain is our local track here. It's about four and a half seconds faster around the track on a two minute course. So it's way faster. And then as far as just daily, like it's just really hard. Like I'm going to go to jail on it. <laughs> Um, you, know, you just find yourself sliding up on ramps and off ramps and just driving like a real jackass just because it's so easy to do it. <laughs> Alright, so yeah, this is where I started everything. This is in our, our main unit where the office is, but I started this just over 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, last July, so we're going on 11 this July, but this is the first piece of equipment I had was this welding table here and that welder. So I scrammed some money together to buy a little cheap bandsaw and the bulk of the business in the beginning was making exhaust manifolds for the original 2.2 liter. But then it really evolved once we started doing RS3 work, we started making these in bulk. Like, I don't know, yeah, this is 548. So we've made, we've made quite a few of them and it's just assembly line work, you know, we're doing we're trying to do 40 or 50 kits at a time and doing really nice lines, hard lines. And you know, we, we treat our kits as if we're an OEM supplier. We're not trying to make a one-off kit. We want everything to be the same. We want to be able to make sure the tuning's all the same. All of our kits, we, you know, these are, these are for current orders, but we clock, we pre-assemble all the lines. Everything is ready to go. So there's no fuss of people having to attach the lines and wondering how to clock them. If you can install a stock turbo, this is plug and play. You know, there'll be no, no difference. We, we, we kind of moved to that early on just because we found that you, know, you can either charge the client here to do it or they're going to char get charged by their local shop to install it. And 
they may or may not get it right the first time. They may or may not damage parts. They may or may not tighten things correctly. So for us, it's just, it's the most expensive kit on the, the, on the market by far. But when you really start comparing it to other people paying for turbo kits and, and installs, it all works its way out. It's just, you know, that we've done it for them and we're the, we're the original manufacturer. So every single turbo kit we do has the lines all clocked and you know, we use hard lines where we can just to help minimize heats against turbines and stuff like that, just because we do warranty the bulk of our work and we don't want it coming back. So this is a really neat car. This is the new KTM Crossbow. It, it, this is actually a GT2. This car is owned by Patrick Skews. You can follow him on Instagram, 07K versus the world. This guy right here. <laughs> but what's really cool about these cars is that they use the plot, you know, they use the engine, the drivetrain out of the RS3. So. It's like another one of those really dumb luck things where, you know, we're able to basically take everything that we've learned from our RS3 work and just pile it into this thing. They'll have this as a road going version as well with the DQ500, literally the same exact engine and controller and ECU that's used in the RS3. So. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna see 12, 13, 1400 wheel horsepower KTMs pretty darn soon. You know, it's a proper race car. You know, this on Spring Mountain, we're putting, what, two and a half, three seconds on Senna's? This is a legit race car. Um, the internet will cry quite a bit when we turn them into straight line cars, but good news, it's not your money, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, really neat cars. This has a sequential in it, Hollinger. Um, it's a Motec car from, from KTM. Um, so, you know, we, we'll, we've had to re-engineer some of the stuff just to be able to, to get in and be able to do what we want with the cars, but, um, you know, we know this power plant super well. That's kind of the five-cylinder, it's just a pound-for-pound pound monster. They're really compact. If you look at the length of this thing, it's, it's shorter than a K24, uh, than a K-series, even though it's a five-cylinder, so, like, you really can get a pretty cool package for the weight and the complexity of the engine and um, you know that's why a lot of uh, there's a lot of kit car builders or low volume builders that are using the 07k evo the, the daza as a start point for making a bunch of power yeah so you know what something that separates us from most of the the people out there is just we like to do good engineering work and the cost really isn't important to us because we've managed to establish ourselves as a high end enough of a brand that it doesn't matter that this intercooler costs four or $500 more than the next, next intercooler out there. People know that we're not skimping whatsoever. So, you know, you see really nice Garrett cores that by far are the best in the, in the space. And then we're able to do really neat things. You know, the, the tendency in the aftermarket is just to put a big intercooler in front of the car and hope for the best. But it turns out if the air is not actually going through the core, it's not actually cooling anything. So, you know, we have a scanner and we have uh, a big ROMer arm that we pull everything, we scan engine bays and figure out how to make things fit. And, you know, we can capture all the air and get them through the core. And, you know, really cool features like the temperature sensor for ambient just comes right through this, this grommet here. And it's all sealed off to where, even though it's hanging in front of it, it's able to still seal off the entire package and it doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, we, we see about a six to 7% increase in efficiency through the core, but why wouldn't you? If, if money's no object, or if you're really looking for the most performance, why wouldn't you do stuff like that? And that's something that we really strive to do. This is my RS3. This is the car that we bought first. The funny part about this car is we talked about like how iRose blew up, right? Like I distinctly remember signing the papers. This is the first new car I'd ever purchased in my entire life. I think I paid like, $66,000 for it or whatever, but I was terrified how I was gonna pay for it. Um, like looking back, it's comical, but you know, it's become probably one of the most, if not the most iconic RS3s on earth. In fact, like there was somebody that tattooed, did I show you that? They tattooed a picture of this car on their thigh. And it's not a small tattoo, it's like this big. So like that's, in our world, this car has become pretty iconic. You know, this is the car that beat Ken Block, the Hunicorn.
that went sevens first. The only car that's gone sevens. It's pretty fun watching this car really has made my business explode and made us to where we're a player in the in the world of Audis and you know we're, we're well respected and whatnot but yeah I, I, I've thought about selling it a few times I just mostly just because I want someone to to enjoy it and just keep keep motoring with it and keep going faster we just don't have a ton of time for it anymore but I don't think I will um, and then yeah over here is, I think we're gonna drive this one as a demo or maybe the blue one in front of it but we do a lot of these in fact this exact same color package is super popular people really like this turbo blue but you know, this is a very cookie cutter car. This car just got back from Bradenton. Um, this car went 863 at 160 miles an hour. True street car. We probably build one of these cars a month of this color combo and this exact spec. They're all over the facility. This is about a, f my guess is he probably has 45 to 50,000 into the car. Uh, um, on top of the purchase of the yeah. car. So you're probably like 110, 120 all in. It's still pretty incredible value. Um, you know, even R35s, that's pretty hard to get in R35 world. It's a pretty dang good value, bang for buck. The, the real beauty of this car is it's just light. Um, Audi, this is an all aluminum car for the most part. So roof, chassis, fenders, doors. Um, you know, you put some race seats in it with a lithium battery and some wheels and they're almost under 3,000 pounds. Like that's unheard of for a modern car. You don't have 3,000 pound cars anymore. So um, good aero and then just a motor that's pretty easy to make a thousand horsepower. Like the transmissions we don't touch. They are, this has a clutch pack in it, that's it. And they'll put up with it. I've broke a handful of transmissions in my life. Like they're a really robust transmission. I mean, if you're secure with your masculinity, there's like no better value out there than the TTRS. It's, a, it's an insane platform. Um, you just have to, be okay with if like you're a Miata guy or like an S2000 guy, you probably can get a, get away with it. You can you can do it, but you know a lot of people just can't get past the stigma of the hairdresser car, which is so wild because like or being a girl's car. We've built like two of these for girls, and we've probably built a hundred of them by this by this point. So it's the guys that are buying them definitely aren't girls nor hairdressers, but it still has that stigma, right? <laughs> A TT for a little bit, a white one, um, but that was the vanity play on it. It was just I do hair, like just it's just that much more tasty when you when you put a bus length on somebody with a plate that says I do hair. It just it hits the man's man just right in the feels. So. <laughs> So this service, this is where we're doing uh, most of the service work is the, the grunt work of pulling engines out, taking them apart, taking transmissions out, taking them apart, kind of the dirty side of, of our industry. But um, you know, behind me, these are just cars that are um, in that 12 to 14 week cycle. So you know, you'll see that most of these have big gaps on the, the fenders. It's because they don't have engines in them. Um, and I think I mentioned in, uh, in a part of this video that we do a bunch of these blue ones. Like, it's crazy. We, we, it's a really popular color. That and these gray ones, you can't swing a, a rope around here and not hit one. But yeah, so it's just like the very first part of it. We'll step into the engine room here in a second. You'll see everybody's engines in various stages, either already been balanced or blocks that have been sleeved, unsleeved. You know, we just, it's an assembly line. So. Um, you know, we have another facility that houses another, we try to keep 30 cars in our rotation at all time. So, you know, you do the math, we're trying to do two a week, um, in 14 week periods, it's about 28 cars. And so 28 is the, is the goal. And, you know, when we're taking in more cars or, or well, that's dependent on how many cars we've been able to get out on a monthly basis. So we, you know, everybody's heard that sad story of a car being at a shop for years. Um, we sometimes get over budget for time if it's an exotic build, but we really don't try to do the exotic stuff. We're just really trying to do the cookie cutter, 850 horsepower packages, 1000 horsepower, or our 1100 package. Um, and that's, that's the bread and butter. That's what keeps this place 
making money and keeps our lifestyles the way they are. It's not the exotic stuff. That stuff just does not make money. So speaking of exotics, um, yeah, this is a byproduct of good five cylinder development over the years. We've really jumped into these, these V10s. We have a huge partnership with AMS Performance out of Chicago. Really good friends of mine that I've known for years that we've done not only just, just uh, V10 work with, but we've played with both the Golf R and we've developed some parts for that and they've developed some parts. So um, they're, they're similar to us, a very good engineering firm that values engineering over um, aesthetics or, or it drives me so nuts when you have exhausts that like coil everywhere when you can just dump it out of the 90 and it'd be more efficient. So um, yeah, this is a, the, the V10 platform. This particular car is on some 72 millimeters and made 2200 wheel horsepower, basically where, where the platform is at the moment. The, the transmissions are getting better and better every day. It's still pretty much, in my opinion, the Achilles heel. Um, you know, people that are bragging about billet blocks and stuff like we we're blowing up gearboxes with stock rods and motors. So I don't know what the extra torque of a built motor or built billet block is really going to do if we can't get the transmissions together. But um, we work with Dotson out of New Zealand, uh, and they are they're coming up with solutions on the monthly basis to to try to make those transmissions stronger and stronger. This one had. I think we made almost 1,900 wheel horsepower on this car on the factory engine. Uh, we didn't hurt it, it's just that the client decided he wanted some insurance. So we pulled it down, put some rods and pistons and a sleeve block and back out with it with, uh, with some more power this next time around. But um, you know, pretty much we can get, we can go sevens on these cars with about 18, 1,850 wheel horsepower is kind of the threshold for getting them into the, the sevens, which is insane. Like what a cool time to be alive, right? And that blue car next door, I filmed once with the Hoonigans and they like to film up in Northern California, which is like 600 miles from here. And one weekend I drove up there doing a series called Plaid versus the World. And so we were racing these Tesla Plaids and just to have cool content, we decided to drive it there. And I drove it there with no support car. I just drove it raw. They're all flex fuels, so we just can run them on 91 or E85. But drove there, handled business with the Plaid. It's a good episode if you haven't seen it. down the coast to San Diego, met my family at an Airbnb on the beach, and then drove home in it. Like, you can't, like, that's incredible to be, have a seven second car that you can drive 1,500 miles in a weekend comfortably and have be reliable and still have stereo and air conditioning and pretty cool time to be alive. <laughs> So over here is um, just workflow. You know, we have various engines that are in stages, but um, you know, here you're seeing a motor. I can tell that it's probably for a thousand build just because it has sleeves in it, or a thousand or more. Uh, you know, typically a thousand horsepower is when we start sleeving them, and it's not it's not horsepower either. That really bugs me when people talk about <laughs> limits of stuff in horsepower. Really, about 800 foot pounds of torque is where we start feeling like the combustion chamber and just cylinder pressures get too high for the factory sleeves. Roughly 26 engines that are in, in queue right now. And then back there you can see some of the V10 cranks for the, we do a lot less of the V10s than we do with the, the, them, but this room behind you is where all the assembly work does, which it's in this room because it's climate controlled, so we can measure everything final, for final assembly. You know, and everything's pre-oiled here. We put oil into the galleys, pressurize it to where first time it starts up, everything's kosher and we rarely have problems with engines very 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 rarely so um, yeah just good methodology that we've developed over the years that makes us successful and makes it to where we can really crank out cars yeah yeah so this car belongs to um, Robin we asked him if we could film in it today it's a guy from Canada super cool client he dropped this off you know a few months ago and it's our thousand kit makes like 1,030 on the dyno without nitrous. It does have nitrous, we're not gonna play with it today. Um, yeah, we'll start warming up the tires here. It's pretty cool, so we can decouple the, the center differential and then um, do burnouts with um, 
you know, stationary burnouts just to get the front wheel drives burning. So we'll start off with that, just get the tires warm. We just did a front wheel drive burnout in a hairdresser's car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> briefly <laughs> and you what, what was the theory you had to you had to do the Australian yeah the triple. three the 300 kilometer per hour is really important for you guys so I just had to touch it real quick <laughs> you get in and just bust out like a, I don't know, a quarter mile run just first go. You know what's really fun is when you just skip over the tens and the nines. <laughs> and we did that at, at DCT World Cup this last week. We had a couple of cars that have never gone tens or nines, only eights. That's pretty fun. Wow. <laughs> get arrested if we keep driving around <laughs> plus you're low on fuel so um i just stay in first gear to start off with um uh, but yeah so you'll you'll kind of give it a good here and you'll give it full throttle and you're backing off and then you're just really not that much angle and i'm like 20 percent throttle here it's really not all that much to get it to keep sliding same when you're swapping. I mean, we're almost straight here. Okay. You got this. I got this. <laughs> Don't need to be in sport or anything weird. So or... you'll just go there and then you'll just go into manual, manual. and then I just keep it in first gear for what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, like there you go. Yeah, that'll do. I call that a pretty good day. That's productive. <laughs> <laughs>